Mansfield Park by Jane Austen, dramatised in three episodes by Elizabeth Proud, with Hannah Gordon as Jane Austen, Michael Williams as Sir Thomas Bertram, Jane Lapotere as Mrs Norris, and Amanda Root as Fanny. Episode 1. The Family at Mansfield. In 1780 or thereabouts, Miss Maria Ward of Huntingdon, with only £7,000, had the good luck to captivate Sir Thomas Bertram of Mansfield Park in the county of Northampton. All Huntingdon exclaimed at the greatness of the match. A baronet with a handsome house and large income. The girl is at least £3,000 short of any equitable claim to it. Oh, Mr Ward, what luck for your niece <laughs> and for her sisters. Yes, and since they are quite as handsome mm. as she is, they are likely to marry with equal advantage. Yes. yes. But there certainly are not so many men of large fortune in the world as there are pretty women to deserve them. At last, the eldest sister found herself obliged to be attached to the Reverend Mr Norris, a friend of Sir Thomas's. A clergyman? <laughs> and scarcely any fortune. But happily, Sir Thomas is able to give him the living at Mansfield. Yes, they will have almost a thousand a year. Hmm. But the youngest sister fared much worse by fixing on William Price, a lieutenant of marines, without education, fortune or connections. She oh, could hardly have made a more untoward choice. Uh. Consequently, an absolute breach between the sisters took place, which put an end to all intercourse between them for 11 years. Then Mrs. Price addressed Lady Bertram in a letter which spoke so much contrition and despondence, such a superfluity of children, and such a want of almost everything else. I am at my wit's end, dear sister, being now preparing for my ninth, lying in, and scarcely knowing how to manage with the other eight. My eldest, William, longs to be out in the world. Is there any chance of his being useful in, in a few years' time in Sir Thomas's West Indian property? Nothing would be beneath him. Oh, my poor sister. Cannot something be done to help her, Sir Thomas? I can send her some money in baby linen, at least. I will do my best for the boy when he's a little older. You are both very generous. But I wish that poor Mrs. Price could be relieved from the expense of one child entirely. What if we undertook among us the care of the eldest girl? I think we cannot do better, sister. Let us send for the child. I do not know, my dear. It is a serious charge. She would have to be adequately provided for, and there are our own children to be considered. My dear Sir Thomas, I entirely agree with you. But give a girl an education and introduce her properly into the world and ten to one but she has the means of settling well without farther expense to anybody. I suppose so, Mrs Norris, You but... are thinking of your sons, but do not you know that of all things upon earth that is the least likely to happen, brought up as they would be like brothers and sisters. It is morally impossible. She will never be more to Tom or Edmund than a sister. And is not she a sister's child? Of course she is. My dear Sir Thomas, poor as I am, I would rather deny myself the necessaries of life than do an ungenerous thing. So if you're not against it, I will write to my poor sister and make the proposal. Very well. Ah. <sighs> Mrs Norris had not in fact the least intention of being at any expense whatever in the child's maintenance, for her love of money was equal to her love of directing. Where shall the child come first, sister? To you or to us? Oh, sister, I am sorry to say that it is quite out of the question for the little girl to stay with us. But I thought she would be a welcome addition at the parsonage, as you have no children of your own. You're wholly mistaken, Sir Thomas. 
Mr. Norris's state of health makes it an impossibility. If ever his gout improves, it will be different, but just now... Then she had better come to us. Yes, we will endeavour to do our duty by her, and she will at least have the advantage of companions of her own age. Very true. And it will be just the same to Miss Lee, whether she has three girls to teach or only two. I suppose, sister, you will put the child in the little white attic near the old nurseries? I dare say. I hope she will be sensible of her uncommon good fortune. We must expect ignorance, meanness of opinions, and vulgarity of manner. Oh, dear. But these are not incurable faults. I hope she will not tease my poor pug. I have but just got Julia to leave it alone. What is the child's name, do we know? Fanny. The little visitor was as miserable as possible on her arrival at Mansfield Park. She was small of her age, which was ten, with no striking beauty and exceedingly timid and shy, afraid of everybody and ashamed of herself. It's wicked of me not to be happy. But oh, how I wish I was safe at home. <clears throat> now then, Fanny, I hope you're a good girl. Of course she is. I've been telling her all the way in the carriage of her wonderful good fortune and how grateful she should be for it. There now, Fanny, come and sit on the sofa with me and hug. Oh, yes, Perhaps you'd like some gooseberry tart. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Dear <laughs> me, this will not do. <laughs> Perhaps she's tired. Yes. Mariah, tell Alice to put her to bed. Yes, yes go along with your cousin Mariah, child. This is not a very promising beginning. After all, I told her to. I wish there may not be any sulkiness of temper. Her poor mother had a good deal. <clears throat> we must make allowances for such a child, Mrs Norris. For a week, Fanny crept about the enormous rooms in constant terror and ended every day's sorrows by sobbing herself to sleep. But no suspicion of her unhappiness was conveyed by her quiet, passive manner until she was found one morning by Edmund, the youngest of the sons, sitting crying on the attic stairs. My dear little cousin, what can be the matter? Are you ill? No. Well, is anybody angry with you? Have you quarrelled with Mariah and Julia? Well, then, are you puzzled about your lesson? Perhaps I could explain it for you. No. Thank you, Cousin Edmund. Is it perhaps that you were missing your home? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Come now, you shall tell me all about your brothers and sisters. Who is your favourite? William. He, he did not want me to... He will write to you, I dare say. Yes, he promised. But he told me to write first. And I, I have not any paper. If that be all your difficulty, I will furnish you with paper and rule your lines for you. Would it make you happy to write to William? Yes, yes, very. Then let it be done now. And when you have written the letter, I will take it to my father, to Frank, so it will cost William nothing. And... I will add a message myself and send him half a guinea under the sea. Oh, Cousin Edmund. Come along. How can I ever thank you? From this day, Fanny grew more comfortable, though to be sure, Maria and Julia thought her... Prodigiously stupid! Only think, Mama, my cousin never learnt French. Well, Julia, it is very unlucky. But there's no harm in the poor little thing. She's always very quick in fetching anything I want. And you must not expect everybody to be as forward and quick at learning as yourselves, my dears. But, Aunt, she is really so very ignorant. Yes, Maria. But it is not at all necessary that she should be as accomplished as you are. On the contrary, it's much more desirable that there should be a difference. Thus, Fanny, with all her faults of ignorance and timidity, grew up not unhappily among her cousins at Mansfield Park. Mm -hmm. 
Only once in the course of many years had she the happiness of being with William, who, determining to be a sailor, was invited to spend a week in Northamptonshire before he went to sea. Edmund knew her to be clever. She has a fondness for reading, which, properly directed, must be an education in itself. He recommended the books which charmed her leisure hours. He encouraged her taste and made reading useful by talking to her of what she had read. In return for such services, she loved him better than anybody in the world. Except William. I love them both equally. Tom Bertram, the eldest son, had already given his father much uneasiness. Thinks himself born for expense and enjoyment. Oh, thank goodness for Edmund's good sense and uprightness of mind. Edmund was to be a clergyman. And the girls, I trust, will make respectable alliances. When Fanny was fifteen, Mrs Norris was obliged by the death of her husband to quit the parsonage and removed to a small house in the village. The living was hereafter for Edmund, but Tom's extravagance had been great. I blush for you, Tom. I must now dispose of the living instead of keeping it for Edmund. You have robbed your brother, perhaps for life, of more than half the income which ought to be his. I am not half so much in debt as some of my friends, sir. Upon my soul, my father makes a most tiresome piece of work of it. I dare say the new incumbent will die very soon. On the contrary, Dr Grant is a hearty man of 45. Yes, a short-necked, apoplectic sort of fellow. Ply him well with good things and he'll soon pop off. Sir Thomas now expected Mrs Norris to claim her share in their niece. Fanny heard the news with a sorrowful heart. Cousin Edmund, I love this house and everything in it. And you know how uncomfortable I feel with my Aunt Norris. She never knew how to be pleasant to children. But when you are her only companion, you must be important to her. Oh, I can never be important to anyone. My dear Fanny, you have good sense and a sweet temper and a very grateful heart. I do not know any better qualifications for a friend and companion. You are very kind to think so well of me. Oh, cousin, if I am to go away, I shall remember your goodness to the last moment of my life. Oh, my Fanny... You speak as if you were going 200 miles off instead of only across the park. You will have as free a command of the gardens as ever. The same library to choose from, the same horse to ride. Dear old grey pony. However, this discourse might as well have been spared, for Mrs Norris had not the smallest intention of taking Fanny. Good heaven, what could I do with a girl of 15? The very age to put the cheerfulest spirits to the test. We thought she would be a comfort to you and company, you know, sister. Dear sister, what am I fit for but solitude? If I can but make both ends meet, that's all I ask for. Sir Thomas says you will have 600 a year. I do not complain, but I must retrench where I can. I own it would give me great satisfaction to lay by a little at the end of the year. I dare say you will. You always do, don't you? It's all for your children's good. I should be glad to think that I could leave a little trifle among them. No, <laughs> Sir Thomas will take care of that. They are sure of being well provided for. Well, but his means will be rather straitened if the West India estate is to make such poor returns. I heard he suffered considerable losses. Oh, that will soon be settled. He's been writing about it, I know. Well, if he should speak again about my taking Fanny, you will be able to say that my health and spirits put it quite out of the question. Dr and Mrs Grant, the new arrivals at the parsonage, showed a disposition to be friendly and sociable, though Mrs Norris soon found out their faults. The doctor has a good dinner every day. And Mrs. Grant gives her cook as high wages as you do here, sister. The quantity of butter and eggs that are consumed in that house. A year after this, Sir Thomas found it necessary to go to Antigua to settle his affairs, and he took Tom with him. In the hope of detaching him from some bad connections here. Nobody grieved much for Sir Thomas's absence, except Fanny, 
who grieved because she could not grieve. Indeed, Lady Bertram was astonished to find how well Edmund could supply his father's place. <laughs> The winter passed in a flurry of gaieties for the Miss Bertrams, while Fanny stayed at home with her aunt, quite happy in being useful. The ensuing spring deprived her of her valued friend, the old grey pony. Edmund was absent at the time, and when he returned, the ill effects in Fanny's health were clear. This will not do. Fanny must have a horse. But she may ride her cousin's horses at any time when they do not want them. Of, of course, course she may. may. But I'm sure Mariah and Julia have wanted their horses themselves every fine day. Of course we have. So Fanny must have a horse. Oh, but it is improper for Fanny to have a regular lady's horse in the style of her cousins. Dr Grant might now and then lend her the pony he sends to the post. That would do vastly well. No, no, Aunt. Well, I'm sure Sir Thomas never intended Fanny to have a horse of her own, and I must say that Surely I... Surely there is no great hurry, Edmund. Only wait until Sir Thomas returns, and then he will settle it all himself. He will be home in September. And now it is June, and Fanny must wait until September for regular exercise? You know that walking too much knocks her up. Well, the steward might lend us one. No. I shall exchange one of my horses for one suitable for my cousin. I know where to find one. I suppose you have no objection to its being for Fanny's use, aunt, as it will still be my property? Fanny's delight in the new mare was beyond all her words to express. Edmund is so kind and considerate to me. I can never thank him enough. It was as well Lady Bertram's counsel of waiting until September had not been followed, for when September came, Sir Thomas was still abroad. Unfavourable circumstances have arisen, which have persuaded me to send Tom home and wait the final arrangement of the business by myself. I feel dreadful presentiment, sister. It seems as if Sir Thomas has some foreboding of evil to himself. No such thing, aunt. My father was in excellent health when I left Antigua. So you say, Tom, but I cannot be easy. However, if poor Sir Thomas is fated never to return, it would be peculiarly consoling to see our dear Maria well married, and Mr Rushworth is very attentive. Mr Rushworth was a heavy young man, with not more than common sense, who, being inclined to marry, soon fancied himself in love. Miss Bertram is a very beautiful girl. The young lady was well pleased with her conquest. I ought to get married, you know. I am nearly twenty-one, and Mr Rushworth has more money than Papa, and a house in town, which is a prime object. Mrs Norris being most zealous in promoting the match, the young people danced with each other at a proper number of balls, and an engagement was entered into. No one felt a doubt of Sir Thomas's approval, and his only condition was that the marriage should not take place until his return. I hope to leave Antigua before the end of the summer. Edmund was the only one who could see a fault in the business. If Mr Rushworth had not 12,000 a year, he would be a very stupid fellow. Such was the state of affairs in the month of July, and Fanny had just reached her 18th year when the society of the village received an addition in the brother and sister of Mrs Grant. They are the children of her mother by a second marriage and brought up by their uncle, an admiral, you know, uh, Mr. and Miss Crawford, young people of fortune, I understand. He has a good estate in Norfolk, and she has 20,000 pounds. My dear Mary, it is such a delight to have you here. And I must tell you that I have found you a most suitable match. You shall marry Tom Bertram. I have seen Mr Bertram in town, I think. He is the eldest son of a baronet, is not he? He is. And you, Henry, shall marry the youngest Miss Bertram, a nice, handsome, good-humoured girl. I'm much obliged to you, sister. <laughs> My dear Mrs Grant, no one can persuade Henry to marry. He is the most horrible flat that can be imagined. <laughs> Henry, I will not believe 
this of you? No, I am sure you are kinder than Mary. <laughs> if a young person professes a disinclination for marriage, I know they have not yet seen the right person. At any rate, Mary, you have no disinclination for the state. Oh, I would have everybody marry, as soon as they can do it to advantage. <laughs> The young people were pleased with each other from the first. I like your Miss Bertrams exceedingly, sister. They are very elegant, agreeable girls. I am delighted to hear it, but you like Julia best. Oh, yes. I like Julia best. <laughs> but do you, really? For Miss Bertram is in general thought the handsomest. So I should suppose. She has the advantage in every feature. But I like Julia best because you order me. <laughs> and besides... Miss Bertram is engaged. Yes, and I like her the better for it. Mm. An engaged woman is always more agreeable than a disengaged. All is safe. No harm can be done. <laughs> Why, as to that, Mr Rushworth is a very good sort of young man. And it is a great match for her. But she does not care three straws for him. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, how shall we manage him? We must leave him to himself, I believe. Talking does no good. He will be taken in at last. Oh, but I would not have him taken in. I would not have him duped. Oh, everybody is taken in at some period or other. Not always in marriage, dear Mary. In marriage especially. My dear sister, there is not one in a hundred of either sex who is not taken in when they marry. <sighs> and it must be so, since it is of all transactions the one in which people expect most from others and are least honest themselves. Oh, you <laughs> are as bad as your brother. <laughs> Admiral Crawford has been a bad example, I see. Oh, oh well... Mansfield will cure you both without any taking in. Tell me what you think of the young men. Ooh, they are very fine young men, though I like the eldest best. I knew I should. It is my way. Excellent. <laughs> so you feel he might do? Well, a park five miles round, a spacious modern built house, wanting only to be new furnished, pleasant <laughs> sisters, a quiet mother, <laughs> an agreeable man himself, who will be Sir Thomas eventually. It might do very well. I believe I shall accept him. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings between the two families now became almost daily, and when Tom Bertram set off for the races near Weymouth, Miss Crawford was prepared to find a great chasm in their society. It is a pity that your brother has left us, Mr. Bertram, as I have tidings of my harp at last. I am very glad. I hope there will be no further delay. I am to have it tomorrow. But how do you think it is to be conveyed? Not by a wagon or cart. Oh, no, nothing of that kind could be hired in the village. You would find it difficult just now in the middle of a very late hay harvest to hire a horse and cart. I was astonished to find what a piece of work was made of it. However, Henry has offered to fetch it in his barouche. The harp is my favourite instrument. Did you ever hear it, Fanny? Never. I, I wish for it very much. I shall be happy to play for you both. And, Mr Bertram, if you write to your brother, I entreat you to tell him that my harp has come. He heard so much of my misery about it. If I write, I will say whatever you wish me. But I do not at present foresee any occasion for writing. Oh, what strange creatures brothers are. You would not write to each other but upon the most urgent necessity, and then only in the fewest possible words. Henry has never yet turned the page in a letter. When they are at a distance from their family, they can write long letters. Miss Price has a brother at sea whose excellence as a correspondent makes her think you too severe upon us. Oh, at sea has she? In the King's service, of course. Yes. <laughs> he has been away so many years now. I wish him an early promotion. Oh, thank you, Miss Crawford. <laughs> Do you know anything of my cousin's captain? Captain Marshall. You have a large acquaintance in the Navy, I conclude. We know very little of the inferior ranks. Of various admirals, I could tell you a great deal. When I lived with my uncle, I saw enough of rears and vices. Now, do not be suspecting me of a pun, I entreat. <laughs> it is a noble profession. It has never worn an amiable form to me. Evan, what say you of this plan? We've been talking of the improvements Mr Rushworth means to make at his estate, Southerton, you know, and it appears that Mr Crawford is an expert in that sort of thing. Why should we not make a little party? Oh, yes, do be that. So long to see you. Well, Fanny, how do you like Miss Crawford? Oh, very much. I like to hear her talk. She entertains me. And she is so extremely pretty. Yes, she has a wonderful play of feature. But was there nothing in her conversation that struck you as not quite right? Oh, yes. 
She ought not to have spoken of her uncle as she did. I was quite astonished. I thought you would be struck. I do not censure her opinions, but there is impropriety in making them public. But she speaks of her brother with affection. Yes, except as to his writing her such short letters. She made me almost laugh. I'm sure William would never have used me so. And what right had she to suppose that you would not write long letters? The right of a lively mind. Perfectly allowable when untinctured by ill humour. And certainly Miss Crawford has none. I am glad you saw it all as I did. He had a good chance of her thinking like him, having formed her mind and gained her affections. Though, on this subject, there began now to be some danger of dissimilarity, for he was in a line of admiration of Miss Crawford, which might lead him where Fanny could not follow. The harp arrived. <laughs> and Edmund was at the parsonage every day to be indulged with his favourite instrument. At the end of a week, he was beginning to be a good deal in love, and, to the credit of the lady, it may be added that he began to be agreeable to her. I can hardly understand it, for he talks no nonsense, pays no compliments, has none of the gaieties of small talk, but I like him. Fanny was a little surprised that Edmund could spend so many hours with Miss Crawford and not see more of the sort of fault which he had already observed. I notice something of the same thing whenever I'm in her company. Best not to speak to Edmund of it, lest it should appear like ill nature. The first actual pain which Miss Crawford occasioned her was the consequence of Edmund's offer of his mare for her first attempts at riding. But Fanny shall not lose her exercise. The mare will be back in plenty of time for Fanny's ride. Miss Crawford's first essay was made with no inconvenience to Fanny, but on the second day, the lady's enjoyment of riding was such that she did not know how to leave off. It is a pleasure to see a lady with such a good art for riding. I never see one set a horse better. Very different from you, Miss Price, when you first began six years ago. Lord bless me, how you did tremble. Yes. I wonder that Edmund should forget me. And the poor mare. It is hard upon her to have double duty. She should be remembered even if I am forgotten. Here they come now. Apologies for keeping you waiting. Please, don't apologise, Miss Crawford. Fanny is in no hurry, are you, Fanny? There is time for her to ride twice as far as she ever goes. I wish you may not be fatigued by so much exercise. Oh, no part of it fatigues me, but getting off this horse... <sighs> Miss Price, I give up this delightful animal to you with a very bad grace. Thank you, Miss. Here you are, my beauty. One moment, Fanny. Do you mean to ride tomorrow? I do not know. No, not if you want the mare. Not for myself. But whenever you are next inclined to stay at home, I think Miss Crawford would be glad to have her for a longer time. Oh. She has a great desire to get as far as Mansfield Common. I shall not ride tomorrow, certainly. I have been out very often lately. Thank you, Fanny. The ride to Mansfield Common included all the young people but Fanny and was much enjoyed. A successful scheme of this sort generally brings on another, and four mornings successively were spent in showing the Crawfords the country. On the fourth day, Edmund and Julia were invited to dine at the parsonage, returning about ten. Oh, what a lovely night. There are so many stars. You were all very peaceful. But where is Fanny? Has she gone to bed? Not that I know of. She was here a moment ago. Here I am, on, on the sofa. That's a very foolish trick, Fanny to be idling away all the evening upon a sofa. I, I beg your pardon, Aunt. I must say, ma'am, that Fanny is as little upon a sofa as anybody in the house. Fanny, I am sure you have the headache. Oh, it's not very bad. It is nothing but the heat. Did you go out in the heat? Were we not all out on such a fine day as this? Even your mother was out for above an hour. Yes, indeed, Edmund. We sat in the garden while Fanny cut the roses, and very pleasant it was. Oh, but very hot. Fanny has been cutting roses, has she? Yes, poor thing. She found it hot enough, but the roses were so full-blown that one could not wait. There was no help for it, certainly. But I question whether her headache might not be called then, sister. 
Suppose you let her have your aromatic vinegar. I always forget to have mine filled. She has got it, sister. She has had it ever since she came back from your house the second time. What? Has she been walking as well as cutting roses? Well, your aunt wished to have the roses, and they must be taken home. But were there roses enough to oblige her to go twice? No wonder her headaches. No, but unluckily Fanny forgot to lock the door and bring away the key. So she was obliged to go again. And could nobody be employed on such an errand but Fanny? Upon my word, ma'am, it has been a very ill-managed business. I'm sure I do not know how it was to have been done better, unless I had gone myself, indeed. If Fanny would be more regular in her exercise, she would not be knocked up so soon. She has not been out on horseback now this long while, and when she does not ride, she ought to walk. Between ourselves, it was cutting the roses that did the mischief. I am afraid it was, for the heat was enough to kill anybody. Sitting and calling to Pug and trying to keep him from the flower beds was as much as I could bear myself. I think nobody can just accuse me of sparing myself upon any you, sister. But I really cannot do anything at once. Here, Fanny. Fanny's just drink this. No. Really, I... Drink it. It is only Madeira. I cannot. It will do you good. Oh, thank you. Three times a day. That's right. I am ashamed to think that for four days you have not been able to ride. It shall not happen again. The visit to Southerton now took place. The party were welcomed by Mr Rushworth and his mother with great cordiality, and Mrs Rushworth, proposing that she should show the house to them, led the way through a number of lofty rooms. This is the chapel. It was formerly in constant use morning and evening. Prayers were always read by the domestic chapel. But the late Mr Rushworth left it off. Every generation has its improvements, does it not, Mr. Bertram? Well, it is a pity that the custom should have been discontinued. A whole family assembling regularly for the purpose of prayer is fine. A fine? The obligation of attendance, the formality, the length of time, a formidable thing. Cannot you imagine with what unwilling feelings the former bells of the House of Rushworth did many a time repair to this chapel? Especially if the poor chaplain were not worth looking at. And in those days, I fancy Parsons were very inferior, even to what they are now. Your lively mind can hardly be serious, even on serious subjects. <laughs> However... Oh, do look at Mariah and Mr Rushworth, standing at the altar exactly as if the ceremony were going to be performed. <laughs> oh, Edmund, how unlucky that you are not yet ordained. Mr Rushworth and Mariah are quite ready. <laughs> ordained? What, are, are you to be a clergyman? Yes. I shall take orders soon after my father's return. If I had known this before, I would have spoken of the cloth with more respect. Should we not be moving out of doors? There is much to be done. Yes, indeed. Mother, it is past two, and we are to dine at five. And the Miss Bertrams have never seen the wilderness yet. We do, we do. So you are to be a clergyman, Mr Bertram. This is rather a surprise to me. What is to be done in the church? A clergyman is nothing. I cannot call that situation nothing which has the guardianship of religion and morals, and consequently of the manners which result from their influence. One does not see much of this influence in society. One scarcely sees a clergyman out of his pulpit. <laughs> you are speaking of London. I am speaking of the nation at large. The metropolis, I imagine, is a pretty fair sample of the rest. Do not you agree, Miss Price? We do not look in cities for our best morality. But it will, I believe, be everywhere found that as the clergy are or are not what they ought to be, so are the rest of the nation. Certainly. There. You have quite convinced Miss Price already. But you really are fit for something much better than the church. Come, do change your mind. It's not too late. Go into the law. Go into the law? With as much ease as I was told to go into this wilderness. Now you're going to say something about law being the worst wilderness of the two, but I <laughs> forestall you. Remember, I have forestalled you. You need not hurry when the object is to prevent my saying a bon mot, for there is not the least wit in my nature. I am a very matter-of-fact, plain-spoken being, and may blunder on the borders of a repartee for half an hour together without striking <laughs> it out. <laughs> oh, I wonder that I should be tired with only walking in this sweet wood. 
But the next time we come to a seat, if it is not disagreeable to you, I should be glad to sit down for a little while. My dear Fanny, take my arm. How thoughtless I am. Oh, thank you. I hope you were not very tired. Perhaps my other companion may do me the honour of taking an arm. Thank you, I will. But I am not at all tired. You scarcely touch me. You do not make me of any use. I am really not tired, which I almost wonder at, for we must have walked at least a mile in this wood. Do not you think we have? Not half a mile. Oh, you do not consider how much we have wound about, and it is a very long wood. <laughs> we have been exactly a quarter of an hour here, according to my watch. Oh. Do you think we are walking four miles an hour? Oh, do not attack me with your watch. A watch is always too fast or too slow. I cannot be dictated to by a watch. Ah, here is a bench. Oh, <sighs> Franny, why would you not speak sooner? This will be a bad day's amusement for you if you are to be knocked up. Every sort of exercise fatigues us so soon, Miss Crawford, except riding. How abominable in you, then, to let me engross her horse as I did all last week. I'm ashamed of you and of myself, but it shall never happen again. Your consideration makes me more sensible of my own neglect. Fanny's interest seems in safer hands with you than with me. I shall soon be rested. To sit in the shade on a fine day is the most perfect refreshment. Mm -hmm. I must move. Resting fatigues me. I have looked across that ha-ha till I'm weary. I must go and look through that iron gate. Oh, locked. Now, Miss Crawford, if you will look up the walk, you will convince yourself that it cannot be half a mile long or half half a mile. It is an immense distance. I can see that with a glance. If we were to walk along the ha-ha, we could better determine the dimensions of the wood. We will be back in a few minutes, Fanny. I am quite rested now. No, no, no. You must stay where you are. We will be back directly. Now, Miss Crawford, I think I can prove to you how small this wood really is. Oh, proof. You cannot frighten me with your proofs. <laughs> <sighs> Why, Miss Price, all alone? My dear Fanny, how comes this? We thought you were with your cousin and my sister. Yes, I, I, Mr Crawford, I was, but I was tired. So they left me here while they walked a little further. Oh, poor dear Fanny, how ill you have been used. Well, they will be back directly, Mariah. As it is, we can see nothing from here. Should we not go through that gate into the park, Mr Crawford? Yes. I can see a knoll about half a mile off, which will give us exactly the view of the house we need. Come, then. Yeah, I am afraid the gate is locked. Locked? I wish I had brought the key. I meant to bring it. I am determined not to come without it again. Yes, Mr. Rushworth, I dare say. But that does not remove the present evil. Well, I, I suppose I had better go and fetch it. Good. And hurry. Oh, I had only put it in my pocket this morning. You seem to enjoy your drive here, Mr. Crawford. You and Julia were laughing the whole way. Were we? I believe I was relating to her some ridiculous stories of an old Irish groom of my uncle's. Uh, Your sister loves to laugh. You think I'm more light-hearted than I am? <laughs> more easily amused. I could not have entertained you with Irish anecdotes during a ten miles drive. I believe I am as lively as Julia, but I have more to think of now. Undoubtedly. Your prospects, however, are too fair to justify want of spirits. You have a very smiling scene before you. <laughs> you mean literally, I conclude. Yes, certainly the sun shines and the park looks very cheerful. But unluckily, that iron gate, that ha-ha, give me a feeling of restraint and hardship. I cannot get out, as the starlings said. <sighs> Mr Rushworth is so long fetching this key. And you would not get out without Mr Rushworth's authority, or I think you might pass round the edge... Of the gate, uh, with my assistance. Uh, that is, if you really wished to be more at large and could allow yourself to think it not prohibited. Prohibited? Nonsense. I certainly can get out that way, and I will. Mr. Rushworth will be here in a moment, you know. We shall not be out of sight. Or if we are, Miss Price will be so good as to tell him that he will find us near that knob. You had better not, Mariah. You will hurt yourself. You will, you will tear your gown against those spikes. You will slip into the... Oh! Mariah should not behave so. 
And Mr. Crawford should not entice her. And where are Edmund and Miss Crawford? Hey, Dave. Oh. oh, where are the others? I thought Mariah and Mr. Crawford were here. They were, but Mariah wished to get into the park and Mr. Crawford helped her to climb through. Oh, a pretty trick upon my word. I, I cannot see them anywhere, but they cannot be far off. And I think I am equal to as much as Mariah, even without help. But, Julia, Mr. Rushworth will be here in a moment with the key. Do wait for Mr. Rushworth. Oh, not I. I have had enough of the family for one morning. I have but this moment escaped from his horrible mother. Did you see Mr. Rushworth? Yes. Oh, he was posting away as if upon life and death. Oh, but spare time to tell us his errand and where you all were. It is a pity that he should have so much trouble for nothing. That is Miss Mariah's concern. Not mine. Goodbye. Oh, but Julia, did you see anything of Edmund and Miss... Dear, poor Mr. Rushworth. What can I say to him when he comes? Why? Where is everyone gone? They found they could pass round the edge of the gate, just there. Huh? Julia went after them. They desired me to say... Oh, my cousin Mariah charged me to say that you would find them at that knoll, or thereabouts. Oh, no. I do not believe I shall go any further. Oh, by the time I get to the knoll, they may be gone somewhere else. I have had walking enough. I'm very sorry. It is very unlucky. I think they might have stayed for me. Well, Miss Bertram thought you would follow her. I should not have had to follow her if she had stayed. Pray, Miss Price, are you such a great admirer of this Mr Crawford as some people are? I do not think him at all handsome. <laughs> handsome? Nobody can call such an undersized man handsome. He is not five foot nine. I should not wonder if he was not five foot eight. In my opinion, these Crawfords are no addition at all. We did very well without them. <sighs> if I had only had the key about me at the time. It is a pity you should not join them. They will be thinking of the improvements. And nothing of that sort can be settled without you. Well, if you really think I had better go, it would be foolish to bring the key for nothing. Goodbye, Mr. Rushworth. I think I must go in search of Edmund and Miss Crawford. They have been gone a whole hour. There you are, Fanny. We found a side gate into the park, which was open. Very tempting, you know, Miss Bryce. So we ventured as far as the avenue. Oh, I was hoping so much to see the avenue. I know. And I would have come back for you, only you were so tired. We wished for you very much. Well, that is some consolation. Not quite sufficient, though, to do away the pain of having been left. A whole hour. This has been a fine day for you, upon my word. Nothing but pleasure from beginning to end. A pretty good day's amusement you have had. I think you have done pretty well yourself, ma'am. Your lap seems full of good things. And here is a basket of something between us which has been knocking my elbow unmercifully. What have you been sponging? Sponging, my dear. It's only a plant which that nice old gardener made me take. But if it is in your way, I will have it in my lap directly. Fanny, you carry that parcel for me. Do not let it fall. It is a cream cheese, like the excellent one we had at dinner. Nothing would satisfy that good old housekeeper but my taking one of the cheeses. Take care of it, Fanny. Yes, sir. There. Now, I can manage the pheasant's eggs and the basket very well. It was much pleasanter to the Miss Bertrams to think of Henry Crawford than of their father. November was the black month fixed for Sir Thomas's return from Antigua. My business is so nearly concluded that I propose to take passage in the September packet. A gloomy prospect. Though there are generally delays, a bad passage or something. It will probably be the middle of November, and that is three months off. 
13 weeks. Much might happen in 13 weeks. How happy Mr. Rushworth looks. He's thinking of November. Your father's return will be the forerunner of many interesting events. Your sister's marriage and your ordination. Yes. No, don't be affronted, but it does put me in mind of the old heathen heroes offering sacrifices to the gods on their safe return from foreign lands. There is no sacrifice in the case. It is entirely Mariah's own doing. Oh, yes, I was merely joking. My other sacrifice, of course, you do not understand. My taking orders, I assure you, is quite as voluntary as Mariah's marrying. There is a very good living kept for you, I hear. Which you suppose has biased me. But that I'm sure it has not. Thank you for your good word, Fanny, but it is more than I would affirm myself. On the contrary, it probably did bias me. I see no reason why a man should make a worse clergyman for knowing he will have a competence early in life. It is the same sort of thing as for the son of an admiral to go into the navy. Or the son of a general to be in the army. Nobody sees any wrong in that. No, my dear Miss Price, because the profession is its own justification. Soldiers and sailors are always acceptable in society. <laughs> but the motives of a man who takes orders with a certainty of preferment may be suspected, you think? Oh, no doubt he has the best intentions of doing nothing but eat, drink and grow fat. His curate does the work, and the business of his own life is to dine. There are such clergymen, no doubt. But you can have been personally acquainted with very few of a set of men you condemn so conclusively. You forget that I am the guest of Dr. Grant, who, though he is kind to me and preaches good sermons, is also an indolent, selfish bon vivant, who, if the cook makes a blunder, is out of humour with his poor wife. Hmm. To earn the truth, Henry and I were partly driven out this very evening by a disappointment about a green goose which he could not get the better of. My sister was forced to stay and bear it. I do not wonder at your disapprobation upon my word. It is a great defect of temper. Fanny, it goes against us. We cannot attempt to defend Dr. Grant. No, but we need not give up his profession. Whatever profession Dr. Grant had chosen, he would have taken a... Uh, not a good temper into it. And as he must, either in the Navy or the Army, have had many more people under his command than he has now, I think more would have been made unhappy by him as a sailor or a soldier than as a clergyman. Besides, a sensible man like Dr Grant cannot go to church twice every Sunday and preach such very good sermons as he does without being the better for it himself. Oh, we cannot prove the contrary, to be sure. But I wish you a better fate, Miss Price, than to be a wife of a man whose amiableness depends upon his own sermons. For though he may preach himself into a good humour every Sunday, it will be bad enough to have him quarrelling about green geese from Monday morning till Saturday night. I think the man who could often quarrel with Fanny must be beyond the reach of any sermons. Oh, I fancy Miss Price has been more used to deserve praise than to hear it. Miss Crawford, we need you for a glee. Oh. You say you will, oh. Miss Crawford. Yes, come along, Mary. Oh, very well. You must excuse me, Mr. Bertram. Miss Crawford, do tell us which glee... There goes a temper which would never give pain, I am sure. How readily she falls in with the inclination of others, joining them the moment she is asked. Yes, indeed. What a favourite Mr. Crawford is with my cousins. Yes. Mrs. Grant suspects him of a preference for Julia. I wish it may be so. He has no faults but what a serious attachment would remove. If Maria were not engaged, I could sometimes almost think that he admired her more than Julia. Ah, but it often happens, Fanny, that a man will distinguish the sister or intimate friend of the woman he is really thinking of more than the woman herself. How Indeed. How oh, yes. I, that mm. I will try to think differently in future. Oh, what a lovely night it is. Yes, not a cloud in the sky. On such a night as this, I feel as if there could be neither wickedness nor sorrow in the world. There would be less of both if people were carried more out of themselves by contemplating such a scene. I like to hear your enthusiasm, Fanny. They are to be pitied who have not been taught to feel as you do. You taught me to think and feel on the subject, cousin. I had a very apt scholar. There's Arcturus. Oh, yes. Oh, and the bear. I wish I could see Cassiopeia. We must go out on the lawn for that. Should you be afraid? Not in the least. I come in there. It is a great while since we have had any stargazing. Yes. I do not know how it has happened. Come. No. We will stay till this is finished, Fanny.
At the end of August, Tom returned home, bringing with him a friend, and ready to tell of races and Weymouth and parties and friends, to which Miss Crawford might have listened six weeks before with some interest, but not now. It is very vexatious, but I prefer the younger brother after all. The Honourable John Yates, Tom's new friend, came with his head full of acting, for he had been staying at the house of Lord Ravenshaw, and it had been a theatrical party. Well, Yates, I think we must raise a little theatre at Mansfield and ask you to be our manager. Oh, yes. <laughs> ah, if we had but the theatre they had at Ecclesford. Let us be doing something, be it only half a play, an act to see yes. what signifies a theatre. Well, we yes. must have a curtain, a few yards of green baize for a curtain, and perhaps that may be enough. Oh, quite enough, with only just a side wing or two <gasps> run up, doors in flat, and three or four scenes to be let down. We should yes. want nothing more oh. at Ecclesford. I believe we must be satisfied satisfied with less that would not be time before my father. Nay, let us do nothing by halves. If we are to act, let it be in a theatre completely fitted up with pit box and gallery. Edmund, do not be disagreeable. Nobody loves a play better than you do. True, when it is good, hard and real acting, not the raw efforts of a set of gentlemen and ladies. I have it. The billiard room is the very room for a theatre, precisely the shape and length for it. And my father's room will be an excellent green room. It's yes. to join the billiard room on purpose. Then all we need is a play. Let us go to the library and begin our oh, yes, Are you coming, Miss Price? Oh, oh Fanny is not one for acting. Come! Stay a moment, Tom. Hmm? You're not serious in meaning to act. Never more so, I assure you. I think it would be very wrong. My father being absent and in some danger, and imprudent with regard to Maria, whose situation is very delicate. Oh, you take up a thing so seriously. As if we were going to act three times a week till my father's return and invite all the country. We mean nothing but a little amusement among ourselves. I am convinced that my father would totally disapprove of his grown-up daughters acting in plays. His sense of decorum is strict. I know my father as well as you do, Edmund. Don't act yourself if you do not like it, but don't expect to govern everybody else. No, as to acting myself, that I absolutely protest against. Manage your own concerns and I'll take care of the rest of the family. The scheme advanced. Opposition was vain. However, the business of finding a play that would suit everybody proved to be no trifle. Something must be fixed on. Lover's Vows. Oh, Lover's Vows was the play we were to do at Ecclesford. Well, and why should it not do as well for us as for Ecclesford? Here are two capital tragic parts for Yeats and Crawford, the Baron and Frederick. Oh, I know the Baron already. Well, then, uh, Crawford can be Frederick, and here is the rhyming butler for me, if nobody else wants it. <laughs> oh, yes, but here are not women enough. Oh. Amelia and Agatha may do for Maria and me, but... If what's... I am to play Frederick... I must entreat Miss Julia Bertram not to engage in the part of Agatha. Oh. After the many laughs we have had together, oh. it would be the ruin of all my solemnity. Oh, yes, Maria will be the best Agatha. Oh, yes, yes. Though Julia fancies she prefers tragedy, she walks too quick and speaks too quick. Uh, she can do the old cottager's wife. Cottager's wife? The most trivial, paltry, insignificant part. It is an insult to propose it. At Ecclesford, the governess was to have done it. Oh. In any case, Miss Julia's talents will be wanted in Amelia. I consider it the most difficult character in the whole piece. <sighs> you will undertake it, I hope. No, no, Miss Crawford must be Amelia. If I am not to be Agatha, I am sure I will do nothing. As to Amelia, it is of all parts in the world the most disgusting to me. I quite detest her. Oh, oh, oh Julia! Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Poor Julia. She is jealous. But it's all Mr Crawford's fault. What is this play they have chosen? Lover's Vows. I hope it may not be improper. What will Edmund say? Lover's Vows. Are you sure, Mr Rushworth? Yes, and I am to be Count Castle, and I'm to come in first with a blue dress and a pink satin cloak. And... Lover's Vows. Oh, yes, we have passed almost every part. I play the part which Lady Ravenshaw was to have done, and Miss Crawford is to be Amelia. Mm, I should not have thought it the sort of play. And I have two and forty speeches. Yes, the carpenter wants to know which side to put the door. Come and talk to him, will you? Oh, at, at once, my dear fellow. Mariah, I think this play exceedingly unfit for private representation, and I hope you will give it up when you have read it carefully over. I am perfectly acquainted with the play, Edmund. I think you see things too strongly. Do not act anything improper, my dear. 
Sir Thomas would not like it. I am convinced, madam, that Sir Thomas would not like it. There, my dear, do you hear what Edmund says? If I were to decline the part, Julia would take it, and she would do it far worse, and everyone would be so disappointed. Tom would be angry, and if we are so very nice, we shall never act anything. I was just going to say the very same thing. We must not be over-precise, Edmund. As Mr Rushworth is to act too, there can be no harm. The curtains will be a very good job. I have saved three quarters of a yard of the bays in cutting them out, and we shall be able to send back some dozens of the rings. Dinner passed heavily. Everybody must feel Edmund's disapprobation. Yes, but they will not admit it. They must know it is a most improper play. One that my uncle would certainly disapprove. Surely they will give up the scheme. In episode one of Mansfield Park, dramatised by Elizabeth Proud, Hannah Gordon played Jane Austen and Amanda Root, Fanny. Michael Williams played Sir Thomas Bertram, Jane Lapater, Mrs Norris, Robert Glenister, Edmund Bertram, and Louise Jameson, Lady Bertram. Tom Bertram was played by Kim Wall, Mariah Bertram, Kathy Sarah, and Julia Bertram, Tracy Wiles. Teresa Gallagher played Mary Crawford, Andrew Wincott, Henry Crawford, Michael Onslow, Mr Rushworth, and Malcolm McKee, Yates. Sonny Ormond was Mrs Price, Sharon Bayliss, Mrs Grant, Patricia England, Mrs Rushworth, and Christopher Scott, Mr Ward and the Coachman. The music was composed by Anthea Gomez and played by Christian Mackay, Jill Hartfield, Audrey Douglas and Kathy Gittins. Mansfield Park was directed at Pebble Mill by Sue Wilson. Crawfords cause confusion for Fanny and her brother William returns in part two of Mansfield Park at the same time tomorrow. A detective drama on BBC Radio 4. Communist Hungary during the Cold War. For the special investigator Bertolon Lazar, fighting criminals is hard, but fighting the criminals within the police force is even harder. Good news! Oh, uh, good morning, Chief Fokos. Oh, Shade. Good news! I heard you, Chief Orgot. Don't you want to know what the good news is? Is it good news for me? Is it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't suppose it is. <laughs> then I would rather not know. Let's start again. I don't think I have your full concupiscence. Good news, comrade! Uh, what good news is that, Chief Orgot? You are my dear friend, and I have saved you from the sack. Despite your incompetence... Um, l let us take this one point at a time. What are you talking about, Tibble? Our bosses asked me if I should sack you. I said, no, I defended you, because you are my friend. Am I really your friend? You helped me with our Soviet comrades. That was a narrow glitch. With all their false allegations of skullduggery, that could have been... I did indeed give you valuable assistance during the KGB investigation into our department. I, I was able to re 